Dear friends, dear friends, we're starting, please. Take your seats. So, Deputy Prime Ministers, Ministers, Ambassadors, ladies and gentlemen, please uh, pray silence, Mr. Pazzini. Now let's move on to the next session of the Joint OECD Forum and the Ministerial Council meeting. The launch of the 2016 OECD Economic Outlook. Now, uh, this is the Economic Outlook in English. This is the Perspective Economique de l'OCDE, that's in French, our other official language, and uh, this is the um, version en español. Eh? This is Perspectivas Económicas, um, given that we have a Spanish-speaking chair this year. And uh, we uh, have the OECD Wirtschaftsausblick, uh, which is um, the German version. So. Um, we're really getting uh, very, very international here. Um, and obviously, this is very important in terms of dissemination. Normally, with the, um, the uh, uh, party school in China, we have a translation uh, that starts the moment we um, uh, get it um, out, and we roll it out. and we So we'll have a, a very uh, widespread dissemination. Now, uh, let me... Um, before handing over to Cathy Mann, our chief economist, uh, mention some of the main messages of this report. We see the world stuck in a low growth trap, as I mentioned a moment ago. Global mo uh, growth is projected to continue to, what I would say, to limp along around 3% this year, to pick up only modestly in 2017, 3.3. Moreover, this pickup hinges on avoiding significant downside risks like Brexit, like financial disruptions in emerging markets that are linked to high corporate debt and also to exchange rate risks. This low growth trap involves a cycle in which diminished expectations become self-fulfilling. Firms witnessing low demand growth are naturally cautious about expanding investment. Weak investment then holds back capital deepening, and it hinders the pace at which innovation is embodied in plant and equipment. The result is slow productivity growth, which makes households pessimistic about the pace at which living standards are increasing and restrains the growth of consumption because of expectation. This slow growth of consumption then feeds back into firms' expectations about demand growth. And it results in weak investment. And there we go again. Of course, the story does not fit every single country in this precise way. There are additional shocks and additional factors at play. But overall, something like this dynamic appears to have been affecting the world economy over the past five years. It is a dynamic in which chronically weak demand interacts with a lack of structural dynamism to produce slower growth. Scarred labor markets, in dangerously low inflation. Now, the economic outlook charts a way out of this trap. As the outlook emphasizes, governments need to use all the policy tools they have at hand in a concerted and coherent way. Uh, we have been pushing for what we call the three-legged stool, you know, the, the monetary policy, the fiscal policy, 
the structural adjustment policy. Now it's uh, almost a cliche. Everybody says that we should use all the policies available, etc. But uh, in many cases, we're not. We're talking about it, and we're actually not doing it, not rolling it up. There is now very clear evidence about the limits of what monetary policy stimulus can achieve on its own. Thus, fiscal and structural policies have to be deployed more forcefully to complement monetary policy. Now, there are three messages in the outlook that I would like to mention. First, in many countries, fiscal spending can be expanded or reallocated within the same envelope to more growth-enhancing items. An increase in public investment of a half a percent of GDP, only one half percent of GDP, in all OECD countries would boost GDP by a multiple. And when you're talking about, let's say, the G20 countries, you know, of course, you are capturing a much broader uh, portion of the world's economy. And it would have a not only a big impact on in improving growth, but also it would paradoxically produce a reduction in the debt to GDP ratio because eventually the denominator, which is uh, the GDP, would actually grow, which has been the problem, even with stagnant debts, because the GDPs have been shrinking. Uh, our GDP to our debt to GDP ratios have actually been rising. Oh. Let me also uh, say that um, collective action is key. Uh, an increase in public investment involving all OECD countries would on average boost growth in a governed country in the first year by 0 0.2 percentage points more than in the same country if there it would have been doing the heavy lifting by its own. So simply by the fact that you have this multiplication, that you have this collective action, the efforts of one produce a much greater result than if you do it on your own. And finally, actions across a broad range of reform objectives, investment, innovation, product market competition, market regulations, better skills, labor mobility, financial market robustness are essential in order to help reverse the widespread slowdown in productivity to which we've been alluding for the last couple of days. Now, another possible aspect of the dynamic which is at the center of this year's MCM is the interaction between productivity and inequalities the nexus, as we call it. The sluggish recovery in advanced economies is increasing inequality. The long-term unemployed not only experience extended periods with low income, but, only see, but also see a deterioration of the skills. And that hurts their long-term earnings prospects. And it may also be that high and rising inequality has contributed to the productivity slowdown. If the young have greater difficulty entering the labor market, and especially getting good full-time jobs, then their development and the growth potential of their economies may be permanently impaired. A concentration of rents in some firms, for example, whether because of technology or because of lack of competition or because of bad regulation, can result in both more concentration of the income, of the wealth, and also of the technology, and therefore a weaker diffusion and dissemination of the benefits of technology across the rest of the firms in the economy. And that also affects productivity growth. So if we fail to reverse this productivity slowdown, and if we fail to stop the inequalities from rising further, 
we will be putting at risk the living standards of a large part of our societies. This is why enhancing productivity for inclusive growth is a theme of this year's MCM, why it is a topic of a special chapter in the economic outlook, and why the OECD will continue its work in this area in the years ahead. In fact, we're already at it. Our work on education, skills, innovation, taxes, anti-corruption, inclusive growth, development, regulation, justice are all integral components of the nexus between productivity and inclusive growth. They're all crucial to enhance productivity and generate inclusiveness. So dear friends, we can enhance both productivity and inclusive growth. They are mutually reinforcing. And because we can, we should. And because we should, we will. Thank you all very much. Kathy Mann, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Uh, the Secretary General has given you a very uh, brief but comprehensive overview of what's in the economic outlook. I'd like to uh, give uh, a little bit more detail on why the low growth trap is so damaging and why as a trap, policymakers have to act to get us out of that trap. The whole point is if markets would do it, we wouldn't need to have policymakers intervene. But the self-fulfilling feedback loop that he described represents a situation where market forces haven't, and I would argue won't, get us out of the equilibrium that we are at, low growth in the global economy, and that therefore uh, policymakers need to act. So here is our, our basic picture where we have global growth uh, at 3% basically flatlining, a little bit better uh, for 2017 at 3.3, but certainly not uh, even within you know, shouting range of the 4% uh, that we have um, enjoyed for the last couple of generations. For the emerging markets as well, uh, a 7% back in 2011, dropping in half or nearly half to 4%. Uh, that represents a decline in um, how long it takes to double your generation, double your income across generations, it used to be 10 years, now it's going to be almost 20. And of course, in the OECD, with a less than 2% growth, that prospect is even more uh, challenging. Now, we do face very important risks in this environment where we are already growing very slowly. Uh, Brexit is a key risk, and it is not just a risk to the UK economy, it is also a risk to the global economy. We have already mentioned and had a, uh, the Secretary General gave a, a brief on our work on Brexit at the London School of Economics, so there certainly can be more uh, details uh, that you can find in that, but we would find in the longer term, 2030, that uh, the UK economy would be about 5% in our central scenario smaller so it would, uh, would uh, have a cut in its GDP by 5%. But it wouldn't just be the UK. As you can see in the uh, right-hand panel, this is the near-term consequences of Brexit, going through primarily the financial markets and the consequences through the financial markets on cus uh, consumer confidence and business confidence. And you, you can see that uh, the neighborhood of the euro area would have a cut of about 1% of GDP by 2018. Even the US, kind of far away from the immediate uh, epicenter, would also have a deterioration of about a quarter percentage point. So Brexit is not just a risk for the UK, it is a global risk, and that's why we 
look at it in detail in this economic outlook. It is a risk that we, uh, this risk and other risks, that as policymakers, we need to create insurance against that risk, uh, insurance that comes from more robust growth. So I'd like to turn now to the second chapter of the economic outlook, which is the consequences and also the causes of the very low growth trap. The first consequence and cause is declining productivity. And you can see both advanced countries on the left-hand side and emerging markets on the right-hand side. The green bar tells us what labor productivity growth is uh, in the last uh, post-crisis period. And it's dropped in half or more compared to earlier periods. Labor productivity growth is a precursor of what we can expect for our living standards and for our uh, GDP per capita. And so this is not a good picture. It's not one that we should accept as policymakers. A second consequence of the very low growth period is that incomes are both rising very slowly and they are unequal. On the left-hand panel, you can see that incomes in the green bars have risen less than labor productivity. So even though labor productivity has dropped, incomes have grown even less than labor productivity. What this means is, is that capital share is rising and labor is getting less. Now, it's the left-hand panel masks, because it's an average, it masks what's happening within the income distribution, which is what you see on the right-hand side. Uh, and we can see the widening gap between the top 10% in the red and the bottom 10% in the green. But it's not just the gap widening that is our concern about income inequality. It is also that the middle is stagnant. That's the blue line. That's the median uh, mean income. That has been stagnant through uh, the post-financial crisis period. And in addition, if you look at the bottom, the green line, the bottom 10%, a deterioration in real disposable income. So it's the fact that labor productivity has been lower and income's lower still. And then within the income distribution, a widening gap, a stagnant middle, a falling bottom, and only a rising top. So these are the conditions in which we have this low growth overall, low productivity overall, and widening inequalities. What does that mean for policymakers? And what really should be galvanizing their attention as to why action is needed. The growth rates that we observe and the consequences of low productivity and rising inequality means that as policymakers, we are breaking our promises to our citizens. This chart tells you how we're breaking our promises to the young people. The left-hand panel gives you an idea of how many are not engaged in the labor force at all, not in education, not in training, not in employment. They are not engaged, 15% of the OECD. On the right-hand panel, you can see that over the post-crisis period, the employment rate of youth is negative between uh, 15 to 24. They are less employed uh, as a share than they were before the financial crisis. Unemployment or total disengagement from the labor market in the first 10 years of a, a person's, young person's career means lifetime lower earnings. Lifetime lower earnings. You never make it up. It's permanently scarring. So we have already broken our promises to those youth by having a low growth trap, low productivity, and rising inequality. But we're also breaking our promises to the old people. This is a scenario that, uh, with a declining from 100 uh, index to basically 50, this is a scenario that looks at the prospects for a retiree's earnings of identical individuals who uh, saved for 40 years of their working life, and they put it into a portfolio. And somebody who retired uh, in 2000, well, we indexed that at 100. The same person retiring you know, just 15 years later, their their possibilities if, of their retirement earnings going into retirement is halved. So we are breaking our promises to the old people too. 
Sometimes as policymakers, we say there's a trade-off between young and old, but this time we're breaking our promises to both the young and the old, and the only uh, in the middle, we saw what was happening in terms of the income distribution, so we're breaking our promises to most of them too. So what do we have to do? We can't have this situation continue. Policymakers have to, they can't be in denial, they can't be complacent, they can't be paralyzed, they have to act. And we have the research that can help design the appropriate policies for countries. That's what we do here. Uh, we know monetary policy has already been extremely active. Uh, Secretary General mentioned a number of the concerns we have about monetary policy continuing to act alone. So we talk about fiscal policy. Monetary policy has given fiscal authorities fiscal space. The current environment is extremely low interest rates, in some case negative, to borrow for very long term. That provides fiscal space for governments to utilize to do additional spending on public investment, both hard infrastructure, which a lot of us, we talk about it, but also the soft infrastructure that comes from education at the, at the primary level and for innovation, soft infrastructure as well. It enhances demand in the short term, both hard and soft, as well as creates the foundation for longer term growth and raising productivity. So the exercise we've done here is a half a percentage point of GDP undertaken collectively uh, among the OECD economies. And as you can see, not only does it increase growth in GDP, which is kind of what we would have expected, but also because of the decisions about the types of projects to undertake, we also raise uh, GDP sufficiently to create the um, improvement in debt sustainability that is a um, objective of many uh, policy authorities as well. Now structural policies, we have uh, analyzed those in detail, unique for each country. On the left hand side, we talk about the unique package for each country, the public spending, talking about investment, and creating an environment of firm uh, entry and exit and competition in the marketplace. Uh, talking about improvements to the labor market, geographic mobility in particular, and uh, job mobility across firms. Packaging up in a coherent way, fiscal, monetary, as well as labor, product market, and financial market performance. So we can, we can tailor a policy package to each country based on what we know about your characteristics and what your objectives are. Have countries done that? No. We can see on the right-hand panel, countries in fact have slowed down their structural reforms rather than accelerating them, which is necessary to get us out of the low growth trap. So to summarize, our diagnosis is the global economy is in a low growth trap and many individual countries are as well. This comes from subdued investment, slack trade, insufficient employment, not enough wage growth, and all that wraps up into lower rate of growth of productivity. We have substantial risks both in the near term and more generally Brexit, financial vulnerabilities, which were already mentioned uh, earlier by the Secretary General, and increased financial market volatility. What are the consequences? It's our broken promises. That's the consequences of our low growth trap and the potential risks. The recommendations, comprehensive, meaning fiscal, monetary, and structural. Coherent, choosing the right policies for each country based on its initial conditions and what it needs to do on homework. And then uh, collective. If everybody undertakes this on, by a group, then each of the reforms doesn't need to be quite so challenging to be done. The outcome, we can chart a path to a higher growth that will allow us to make good on our promises. Thank you. Um. There's a very short time for a couple of uh, comments or uh, questions or violent objections, depending on what you choose. And I understand that uh, Boris uh, Kropivnikar, the um, 
Deputy Prime Minister of Slovenia wanted to uh, uh, take the floor, so please, Deputy Prime Minister. Uh, thank you, Secretary General. Uh, when we was listening to this presentation, uh, for me it's first very important that we listen OECD is evidence-based, what you figured out. It's very important that we know with our local policies how we influence uh, with our decisions in the, in the market. And I would just say that uh, question how to speed up the economy, what to find new and where is the role of OECD is for me very important because OECD is a trendsetter. It's evidence-based and it's international. And as I understand, the whole social, economical ecosystem that we are living in needs, as you said, coherent policies. We need also coherent actions between different countries. And I'm asking, where are those uh, triggers that money, which is now cheap, is invested smart? And which are those technologies? And I would suggest that probably these are investment uh, in hard infrastructure, especially synchronized investment in the soft infrastructure, because whatever we need in the world today, it's very international, it's very connected, it's not closed in one border. So also our investments have to be synchronized. And of course, we see a lot of possibility also in the big data field, and the new models, because the productivity or success today is not based in how good product you have, but how good business model you have. So this is base of new productivity. And I was urged that uh, we explore also these areas, share through OECD, good practices, find new models, and find the way how to use big data that our systems will be more effective and more productive. Well, it sounds like you've uh, thought through what the right recipe is, and uh, it just needs to be implemented now. Um, uh, with regard to some of the, the big data and the, and the new business models for productivity, uh, I draw attention to the new Global Forum on Productivity uh, that was launched last year in Mexico and will be having its second uh, annual meeting in Lisbon in July. And that, in that forum, it is, has two uh, tracks to it. One is to present new research using firm level data on how to uh, improve both the policy environment for productivity growth, but also looking inside the firm uh, at management and business models so that we understand uh, not just how the environment works, but how inside the firm and the analysis inside the firm, how that translates into productivity growth or not. You know, it could be an impediment as well as an asset. Uh, but the second track at the Global Pro uh, Productivity Forum is a convening of the institutional bodies within government who are charged with actually implementing the policies that are put forward to enhance productivity growth and to improve prospects for growth more generally and to reduce inequality. That institutional uh, convening, I think, is extremely important as a way of taking the evidence-based research and translating it into policy implementation on the ground actually within countries. Because that often is a challenge. We can produce evidence, but it has to be implemented within countries. And comparing experiences about how to actually make that happen on the ground in governments, I think, is a, a, a real innovation of the Global Forum on Productivity. Thank you. Let me just say that uh, Slovenia is now in the process of drafting its national development plan. And they have chosen the sustainable development goals as their organizing principles. They are actually looking at the mandates contained in, to our own membership in the sustainable development goals. And they are using that as a way to uh, look at the uh, sectors which they're putting together and they're planning. And the other thing is that they're assuming a very intensive use, and that was part of the commentary by the Deputy Prime Minister, of uh, big data, uh, of cloud, of technology, of digital, and using that to the hilt with this organizing concept of the SDGs and then the support of big data as a powerful tool in order to put together uh, the plan for the future of Slovenia. So 
I think it's a very exemplary case where you have these tools, they're happening, the world is putting them out, and one country is saying, well, why not? If it's there, let's use them. Let's put them to best possible use. Uh, let me ask uh, Swazahil Nazara from the Ministry of Finance of uh, Indonesia uh, that um, perhaps uh, may have a comment from the point of view of uh, emerging, emerging countries. Thank you. First of all, congratulations, uh, Secretary General Guria, for your reappointment. Um, I think as a concept, we do believe in inclusive growth, inclusive development. We believe every single person must be able to participate in the growth process in our country. So this is really looking from the point of view of our country. On the, on the other hand, it is also, we also believe in productivity. We believe that the market is good, productivity must be improved we, in order to get out of this low growth situation. Now, if I look at Indonesia, we believe in productivity enhancing poverty alleviation program. Hmm. But for the, for the poor, to push the poor directly going into the labor market and compete for the productivity is a, is a, almost a losing game. So we must come up with a social assistance program. Uh, earlier, President uh, Chilean presid president mentioned about the social inclusion, social cohesiveness, and, and so on. But the question is, what is the balance for the fiscal uh, authority like us? What is the balance between providing the social cohesion and productivity enhancement so that we should not fall into the trap of too generous social protection program, but at the same time are able to maintain the environment for better productivity for higher economic growth? So thank you very much. Thank you, Kathy. So, uh Productivity and social cohesion are not uh, opposites. They go together. Uh, and m the menu of policies that we can put out that enhance productivity and improve equity is a very wide set of policies. The number that where there's a trade-off is actually the smaller number, uh, smaller set. But I mean, that's, that's an analysis that's based on um, advanced countries. Increasingly, we are analyzing these questions using the data from the emerging markets. We have just expanded our data set, and we will be just uh, doing additional research. But I think w the points that I would bring to the fore in the context of Indonesia, but that are also relevant for other emerging markets, is um, that regionalism is often a big challenge. There are some regions of a country that lag dramatically farther behind in terms of not only income, but across a range of outcomes, education in particular, as well as um, uh, productivity. So addressing regional disparities, uh, as we do in the Nexus report, uh, is an important first step to ensuring both productivity growth and uh, inclusion. <laughs> Uh, the second issue that faces many economies, um, not just emerging markets, but uh, increasingly actually uh, advanced economies, is informality. Now, it's called informality in, in emerging markets, but in advanced economy, it's, it's often um, small, short contracts or short time period jobs. It's, it's not informal, but often the kinds of benefits associated with formal contracts don't exist under these short term contracts in advanced economies and certainly don't exist in the context of informal jobs in emerging markets. It is always the younger people and the lower skilled people that tend to be shunted into the informal jobs or the short term contracts. So when thinking about uh, strategies to ensure that that is less likely to take place, uh, it is to uh, bring into the formal economy 
or bring into the benefits economy um, the, uh, the younger and the lower skilled workers. Now how to do that is to enhance business, to improve the business environment. Uh, and then we look at different business regulations and foreign direct investment in particular is an issue facing uh, Indonesia. So those are the strategies where we focus on the individual we create an environment where they are more likely to succeed, and we underpin that with appropriate uh, approaches to education. I'd just like to remark that, you know, when uh, Mr. Nazara's point about shows a little frustration, a little desperation, because uh, when we're trying to level the playing field, we're trying to make them equal and then use the same opportunities, but they're so unequal in the beginning. So how do you close the gaps, you know? And uh, as Kathy said, that's about policy. Uh, last but not least, um, today we woke up with the news that the Juncker plan was being doubled effectively, uh, that 300 billion more were being put into the kitty. Now, that 100 billion had already been invested in about 250 projects, uh, and the only criticism that was being made is it was too concentrated in France and the UK or something like that. Oh. We spoke about flexibility here. Could we depart with a half percentage point? You know, what's a half percentage point among friends? Huh? Now, but on the other hand, we see every day that, uh, you know, Mr. Paduan of Italy and uh, Mr. Sapan of France are, going, are all going uh, to, uh, to Brussels, hopefully to get this little bit of flexibility. And here we're talking that maybe this is the way to get the thing going because the mix is not working too well. And at the same time, we seem to have a way because the Juncker plan, when you contribute to the Juncker plan, that doesn't count for your deficit. So lo and behold, maybe we got something here. Vali Zombrowskis uh, is the vice president of uh, the European Commission. He's also the big... Uh, Umbrella about economic uh, issues, former uh, Prime Minister Latvia, when we got started on the accession process. Uh, could you perhaps tell us, and maybe there's a, some kind of hope in there? Please, microphone, front row here. Uh, yes? This will be the last, the last question, then uh. we'll go to the panels. Uh, okay, uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, Secretary General, honorable uh, uh, colleagues. Uh, indeed, if we look at the economical uh, situation in uh, Europe, we're also asking ourselves the same question, what we, need, uh, what we need to do to strengthen the economic recovery. And we had came up with uh, three economic policy priorities. It's to facilitate investment, it's to continue the work, actually intensify the work on structural reforms to modernize our economies, and it is to continue with responsible uh, fiscal uh, policies. And on, indeed, on investment, well, I would say uh, plan is not uh, doubled yet. Uh, the EU has quite complex procedures which we need to go uh, through, but it uh, cl clearly shows uh, several things. Uh, first, you, you, you can accuse the Europeans of Everything except of being very fast. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but uh, uh, indeed, uh, there, uh, there, there are two things. First, it shows that uh, Juncker investment plan is on track. And with projects adopted so far, we have mobilized already some 100 billion euros of both public and private investment. And there is ambition uh, to do more. Uh, as regards structural reforms, there's also ambitious uh, reform agenda which needs to be implemented and which we also from the EU side uh, uh, very much encourage in different international uh, fora, would it be OECD or, or G20 or, or, uh, or wherever. Uh, and still there is this aspect which is more controversial, which was your question on uh, uh, fiscal responsibility and uh, flexibility. Uh, and one thing is uh, clear, if you uh, run deficit and debt, you run deficit and debt. That needs to be uh, acknowledged and all those ideas, let's not count something towards deficit and debt. Sorry, you still need to finance it. You still need to go to the markets to borrow and to finance. So it's rather the question how we uh, treat different kind of expenditures and indeed we prioritize investment and uh, we uh, allow member states to deviate from their 
fiscal adjustment pass if they uh, do more investment. And in case you mentioned uh, Italy and half a percentage point, by now Italy is already benefiting from 0.85% of GDP of uh, flexibility, uh, both under investment clause, structural reform clause, and also taking into account additional expenditure related to the uh, refugee uh, crisis. But if I may also a very uh, brief uh, uh, question. Uh, I think we all uh, share this uh, analysis and the priorities seem to be uh, going the same direction. But we also know that member states start with different uh, starting positions. And even in this very uh, accommodative monetary policy environment, not all member states, especially those with high public debt levels, are able to finance themselves, uh, so to say, uh, uh, cheaply and without uh, raising uh, uh, concerns about uh, sustainability of public uh, finances. So what would be your advice uh, on the policy uh, mix given these uh, uh, restrictions? Thank you. Thank you very much, Valdis. As I said, this is this morning's news, and it seemed to be particularly relevant uh, to the kinds of things we're trying to uh, discover here, this balance. Uh, thank you uh, to all our commentators and questioners, and uh, uh, thank you all uh, now for uh, preparing for the first and second panels that are going to be analyzing the messages and the contents of the economic outlook. So over to you. Uh, and uh, Kathy, you and I uh, move on. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Secretary General yes. Kathy Mann, um, for that insight. Uh, I am not moderating this next panel. I'm, I'm going to hand it over now to uh, the moderator of panel one, policies to address the global economic outlook, uh, and she will then introduce her panelists. Thank you very much indeed, everyone.